All right then, um, it's just about five minutes past 5.30 in Singapore today. And so let's actually get started um, so that you can, you know, quickly start your journey of learning with Torius, our, our speaker for today. So I'm Renal, I'm the marketing producer at General Assembly. And on behalf of the team, I would just like to thank all of you for taking the time off your very busy schedules to join us for this event. So I'm sure you're all looking forward to hearing from Sotorius, but before I pass over the time to him, um, let me just take a couple of minutes to share with you about General Assembly and what do we do here. So in case you haven't heard about General Assembly before this, we are actually a global tech education company founded in 2011, and we currently have over 30 plus campuses around the world, um, both an online and offline presence. So we actually mainly focus on tech, data and design courses that are aimed to bridge the gap between traditional education and the job skills today's employees actually demand. So, you know, if you're interested to know more about GA or of any of our courses, you can definitely get in touch with us and I'll share with you the contact details in just a bit. But um, before I do that, um, let's just go through something um, slightly regarding housekeeping matters. So. As you can perhaps tell, this is a live stream webinar. So you're not visible or, edible or audible to anyone, anyone else in the audience. So please do not worry about any distracting noises or backgrounds, all good there. But if you do look at the bottom of your screen, you can see that you actually have access to a couple of functions. So some of you have you know, already started using the chat to introduce yourselves, which is great. You can continue using that chat to actually chat among yourselves and you know, just remember to toggle it to all panelists and attendees so that, you know, the greater group can actually see your message as well. On the other hand, if you have any questions um, about the content or about what Sotorius is going to go through today, as well as for General Assembly, please do make sure to pop in the Q&A box so that we can get to that um, sooner and faster. Please um, try not to ask questions in the chat as there's a possibility that we might actually miss out on them. Sorry about that. All right, okay, sorry. So, um, you know, if you're wondering how you can find out more about G's other offerings, um, do reach out to us um, via these methods. So you can either go on our website or you can contact us for more information. So this email is actually for Singapore, but I'm sure wherever you're tuning in from, for example, like especially in the case of Australia, we also have a presence there as well. So you, what, you can, what you can do is you can actually just check out our global website for your local contact and, you know, go right ahead and contact them. Of course, a little bit of a shameless plug here. Please do follow us on our social media. Um, we post about some really fun events like this, as well as other exciting things that, that are happening in GA Singapore. And of course, if you would like to continue your um, learning journey and take it a step further, then do join our remote workshops. You can actually use this code right here. It's bootcamp50 and you'll actually get a 50% off on all our paid workshops. So that'll be really great if you want to like, you know, continue your journey further. Um, yes, so on that note, I will actually pass the time to Sotarius, who's going to help us to demystify digital marketing today. So please enjoy. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Munal, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Hope you are doing great from wherever you are calling. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sotirios. It's a little bit strange because I come originally from Greece. And I used to be an expat living in multiple countries. I studied my career in London, in UK. I didn't really like the weather. I liked everything else but the weather. So I moved to Dubai. I spent quite a bit of time there working with agencies and also startups and also doing some freelance work. And from Dubai, I moved to Singapore, uh, where I also work for some agencies. And eventually I transitioned into teaching, primarily with General Assembly. Uh, so that's a quick overview of my background. Now, today we have a lot of things to, to discuss, as usual. If you have questions or if you want to make a point or for anything that you want to ask, please use the Q&A. Don't use the chat because you're going to make my life harder. Try to put all your questions in the Q&A. 
and from time to time I'm going to pause to go through questions and in the end of the session also we're going to keep as much time as possible uh, to answer all of your questions. Today's topic is about uh, building and managing digital marketing teams. So, so how are we going to get started, right? So first things first, we need to understand what does marketing involve? Specifically, what does digital marketing involve, right? And what I always say is that digital marketing is not really a monolith. It's not just one discipline. I mean, if people tell you, oh, I am a digital marketer, you can't immediately tell what the other person is doing, right? Because digital marketing is a collection of skills, is a collection of disciplines. So if we take a human brain and we cut it in half, we all have two parts, right? So the numerical part of our brain, the left brain, and the creative part of our brain, the right brain. And that's more or less what digital marketing is all about. We have certain skills and disciplines that are more for people that are left brainers, like performance marketing, meaning running Facebook campaigns, Google campaigns, like analytics, like e-commerce, then we have a lot of skills and disciplines that we need to work on that are more for uh, creative people, the right brainers like branding, content, UX. And then we have a couple of disciplines and skills that we need right in the middle. We need people that can understand the full spectrum of digital marketing and can craft a strategy. We need people who can also connect the dots and are able to manage different individuals and eventually get the job done. So that's a quick introduction on what digital marketing is all about. From here now, and before again, we go into how we build a team and how we manage it, it is important to understand the three different types of marketers, and especially the three different types of digital marketers. Obviously, I generalize here, there may be a lot more types of digital marketers, but mainly we have three categories we have what we call full stack digital marketers. These are very experienced people that come with years in digital marketing. They grew their careers within agencies or in-house. They started from a specific discipline, but over time they grew experience across multiple disciplines. So they are what we call a T-shaped digital marketer. They have their expertise. They can be hands-on on one of the many disciplines of digital marketing. But at the same time, they understand everything from A to Z. And these type of people are probably going to be very senior and very, very valuable for any team. Then we have employees and people who are project managers. These are people who don't really go hands on. They don't really execute on a day to day, but they are very good in project managing and connecting the dots. They understand what digital marketing entails. They understand a little bit about every single discipline that is included under digital marketing. And they are able to work with agencies. They are able to work with freelancers. They are able to get all these different specialties and make them work together. And the third type of digital marketer is what we call the specialist. These are typically people that either by choice they want to specialize in a specific area. They may be very senior, but they may choose to do only SEO or only paid search or be only in UX or only work in CRM, right? Or these are typically very junior digital marketers that they are just starting their career and they have exposure in a couple of different disciplines, uh, hands-on and they implement everything that needs to be done, right? So that's in a nutshell, the three different types of marketers. And that's quite important to understand how we can hire the best people for our team and what we really need to, um, to include in our digital marketing team. There are no unicorns now. Like this one person that can do everything, and by everything I mean this one person that can design, they can uh, run campaigns, they can do analytics, they are amazing in Excel, they can do SEO, they can do video editing. These people don't really exist. And if you know any person that can do all of these things, please refer them to me because I'm going to hire them immediately, right? So unicorns typically don't exist. Most of the people outside in the market, including myself, we all have our own expertise. We are good in certain areas. We are not so good in some other areas. Even T-shaped marketers 
it doesn't mean that they do everything. It means that they understand everything, but they still have an expertise. Maybe they can have an expertise in two, three, four different disciplines, but it's very hard to be an expert in everything that digital marketing entails because it's a very vast um, skill set that you need to acquire. Now, a real life analogy, right? Because we always explain that digital marketing includes a lot of different skills, but how does this look like? And we're going to give a real life analogy um, with a house. So let's say we want to build a house. Who do we need now to build a house? We need an architect and the architect is going to design the house. This is the equivalent of UX designers in our world. We need a builder and the builder is going to build the house. He's going to take the bricks and the cement and everything. They're going to lay the foundations and follow the architect's plan to build a house. These people are the web developers that are not really marketers, but they are the ones that help us build everything on the web. Then we need electricians, we need plumbers, we need a lot of other people who are going to, let's say, install power, install water, install the gas, the ACs and everything else that we need to have inside this house. This is the equivalent of search engine optimization, people who are going to take care of your analytics and all the pixels, um, make sure that all the pixels are in place. People are going to, let's say, put the final touches in your content, in your copywriting. So you need a lot of different individuals that are going to actually bring everything together. Then we need painters that are going to paint the house before we move in. This is the equivalent of UI designers, the people who deal with interfaces, making everything look pretty, produce creatives and so forth. Then we need interior designers that are going to decorate the inside of the house. And then we need landscape designers that are going to decorate the outside of the house. And if we are to give an analogy here, we can potentially refer to inbound and outbound marketing in a way. There are people who deal with, let's say, CRM and organic channels. There are other people who deal with, let's say, bringing traffic uh, from external sources through advertising. So similarly to building a house that you will need a lot of different individuals, you just can't, can't just hire one person and this one person will do everything. That's impossible. The same way digital marketing is a team effort. Right? It's not really a game that one person can play. It's not very possible. Now, having said all these things, what does this mean for you that you attended today's event, right? So I'm going to run you through a couple of different scenarios and we're going to get started with solopreneurs, maybe people that are one man so or one woman so that they run a startup, they are a very small company, they do everything themselves and they want to start bringing in new people. Then we are going to discuss what is the difference between a solopreneur and maybe an SME or a family business that they have the operations in place and they just need a helping hand. And from there, we're going to also discuss how a medium-sized company, one million plus dollars of revenue per year, for example, operates, how a funded startup operates, and how a very large company like Lazada, Amazon or equivalent or a big agency operates. Just for you to understand how far uh, you can go and how these big companies operate versus what we do, for example, when we are SMEs or when we are, let's say, solopreneurs, right? So uh, they will give you a very good insight of how these uh, places operate. We are going to get started now with solopreneurs to begin with, right? If you are a one-man show or a one-woman show, first of all, you need to wear as many hats as possible. Again, the idea that you are going to hire this one person that is going to take care of all of your marketing and you are just going to do nothing or you are just going to look uh, from afar doesn't really exist unless you hire a co-founder if you are looking for one person to do all your marketing you need to find a very senior co-founder that can take the role of uh, let's say the the marketer for your business right so if you don't want the co-founder or if you your plans are not to get a co-founder then you will need to wear as many hats as possible and you will have to hire selectively, which means that you shouldn't hire long term because you wouldn't be able to afford, let's say, people for the long term. You should probably rely to freelancers and maybe if you graduate to startups 
uh, maybe you can actually start thinking about hiring part-time, right? What type of people now you need to bring on board? You need to hire opposing skills. So if you are the one doing the creative, you need to bring in a person who is going to do the analytics and the advertising. If you are clueless about creative and copy and all these things, then you need to bring in someone who is going to take control of the creative side of the business and you are going to take control of the operations, for example. So always hire opposing skills. Don't hire for something that you can do on your own, right? And make sure that when you hire these people part-time to help you, you give them very clear and specific tasks. Because when you don't have full-time employees, in order to be able to manage these people, you will need to really give them a direction on what you need them to work on and what is the vision for your company. Even if you don't understand 100% of the opposing skill, maybe you can speak the business language and communicate what is your business objective. What do you want the creative to work on? Uh, why you need someone to, let's say, work on the advertising and so forth, right? If you graduate now to an SME, an SME will probably need two people, maybe in a part-time capacity or even a full-time capacity, depending on the size, the size of the business. And again, these two people are going to have opposing skills. So we'll need someone who lives in the creative space, who can potentially cover everything right brain, can do photos, videos, copy for our website. Why we need this person? Because an SME typically will rely a lot on social media. Therefore, you will need social media calendars. An SME will rely a lot on organic activities. Therefore, you will need to have some form of content that you set, set out. An SME will not have a lot of budget to spend. Therefore, you will need a very solid website with very, very good copy, with very good creatives, so you can maximize your conversion rate. And these are the reasons why you will need a person who is a right brain person and brings in these skills into the table, right? And from there, depending on your size and also depending on who you are and what you are going to take over, you probably need someone who is going to execute, means is going to run small Facebook campaigns in a professional way, is going to introduce email marketing to your business and is going to start thinking about maybe um, are we following up with customers? Do we have a newsletter? Are we following up when someone submits a form? Do we have any email marketing automations? Are we using these channels uh, for our, uh, let's say, business? He's going to think about running tactical campaigns, for example, on specific seasons uh, within the year, let's say Valentine's Day, or there is a, a lockdown or national day and so forth. And he's going to be able to create these campaigns and implement them end to end. So go in the software and work with the software, set everything up, up and send them live. And these two people will eventually need to collaborate, right? So the creative person with the person who implements in practice the campaigns and looks after the analytics will probably need uh, to collaborate. And you will need to manage these two people very closely because again, the smaller you are, the more involved you need to be, especially in digital marketing. There is no other way, right? Unless you are a funded startup. If now you are a funded startup, you are operating or a medium-sized business, and that's the next slide is going to allow you to understand the, uh, the scale of digital marketing operations that a proper company that is 1 million plus revenue has vs a company that is small or it's just starting. So a proper, let's say, medium-sized company or funded startup will have a team that looks like this. Now we are in a completely different world. Now we are in the world of, let's say, very large startups or very promising companies or growing companies. So this team will have a head of digital that is going to be a, either a T-shaped marketer or a very experienced project manager on the top to manage everyone in the team. And typically, we have three different departments. This is not always the case, but I'm just going giving you an example on the most likely scenario on how, a, let's say, a, a very large company or a, a medium plus company will deploy their marketing team. They will have a creative team, including a creative director and some junior designers. And these people will take care of everything visual related, 
uh, visuals for Facebook, for Instagram, for websites, banners, collaterals, everything is going to be taken care of by the creative team. This team will collaborate closely with the performance and analytics team. These are going to be the people who run paid advertising for the most part, but also deal with SEO, a little bit more technical disciplines. So these people will run Facebook ads, Google ads, uh, Pinterest ads, TikTok ads, banner ads. They will buy media. They will work on SEO. They will build reports. They will deal with Google Analytics, with tracking. They will take care of the whole package. And again, it's going to be a senior person and a couple of execs typically split in different areas. And then we're going to have a content marketing team or a PR team or an events team, depending on the type of business you are, because different businesses also have different needs. And under the content team, we are going to have probably writers or we're going to have event managers or we're going to have PR managers or we're going to have social media specialists, the people who are basically taking control of everything social media and their job is going to be to only take care of the community, grow the Instagram account, monitor the Facebook page, uh, and so forth, right? So that's how a large company is going to operate. Moving forward, and I can see your questions already coming, coming in, so we're going to stop at some point to, to take questions. We have large company. Large company now, we're talking Lazada, Booking.com, very big companies, Uber, for example, and so forth, right? Very big big players, also pure players, type of companies that their whole survival depends on the online ecosystem, right? So these companies, they are going to scale even further and they're going to separate their teams even further. So they're going to have a creative team that it may be broken into a couple of different departments. They're going to have probably user experience designers and UI designers. They may have video animator so they may have photographers if they are e-commerce so their creative team is going to be broken into multiple disciplines they're going to have a digital media team that most likely is going to be broken into departments so the seo team will be standalone the ppc and programmatic team or media buying team will be standalone and under each team they're going to have a manager and a couple of execs the content team is probably going to be broken into social media and pr or social media and events, depending on the needs. And a lot of these companies, they will move analytics out of the performance team as a standalone division because they will want to probably implement some data science, science together with their typical analysis. They will need to automate their analytics. So they will need a combination of data scientists plus digital analysts to work under their analytics team. And they're going to have analytics not only for their website, but also for mobile app, for social media, for paid campaigns. They're going to centralize all the analytics under this team. What is fascinating now, and I think a lot of you maybe in this call, by looking at these slides, maybe you started thinking about it already, is that for those of you who didn't experience, for example, let's say agency environments or working maybe in very big companies, some of you are probably already working in big companies. Uh, but not everyone was a part of an agency or not everyone was a part of a big corporate, right? Uh, if you compare now the setup of a large company vs a startup, the difference is night and day, right? It's chaotic in terms of difference. Uh, but that's the size of the operations to understand basically the scale of the operations. And it's not only the scale of how many resources they have at their disposal, it's also the budgets that are kind of night and day. For example, a big company can probably spend half a million dollars to launch a product. A startup or an SME that's going to spend $10 a day on Facebook, something like that, right? So there is a massive gap between small companies and big companies. Uh, but obviously, we need to be smart in terms of how we allocate resources, right? And no one became a large company from one day uh, to the other, right? So Rome was not built in a day. These companies that come with this structure, they evolved and over time they started from one person to two, to five, to 10, to 15, to 20, to even a regional team that expands to various uh, basically departments. Now, some of you, before I go to the questions, will say, wait a moment, all, all these people, right? Is it common? Because I don't get to experience so many people. 
in my company, we are just like two people and we work with agencies. Now, a lot of you may not have visibility on the resources needed because the structure of a lot of companies is to keep everything efficient. And that's also why companies hire agencies and why companies outsource is because hiring all these people and maintaining all these operations, it costs a lot of money, right? And only companies that are pure play, which means their entire business model depends on the digital ecosystem, they in-house everything because it's a, a lot of headcount that you need to bring on board. So if you don't want to bring all this headcount on board, what you can replace it with is you can replace it with agencies. And typically, of course, there are very big brands that have, let's say, 20, 30, 40 agencies. That's a couple of brands or maybe five, 10 brands that we can uh, probably count in our hands that they have 20, 30 agencies. But most brands, they're going to have two to four different agencies. They are going to have one project manager, someone who is working for their team who is not hands-on because all the hands-on work is going to be outsourced to agencies. And they typically have a creative agency that takes care of everything creative, content, social media, copywriting, collaterals, everything is done by the creative agency to a certain extent, sometimes also social media plus the analytics for social media. So this whole part that you see on the left here is outsourced basically to a creative agency. And they are probably going to have a media agency and the media agency is going to take care of everything media, everything performance, as we say, and everything analytics, right? And sometimes everything SEO also. Although the bigger the companies become, sometimes they just want to bring in specialized agencies that they do only SEO or they do only analytics or they just specialize in, in one thing, right? Uh, so that's some structures that exist out there in the market, right? And as you can see, we have a lot of differences between small companies and big companies. Um, I have quite a few things now to, to take you through, but before we go there, let me actually go into some of your questions, right? Just to, to not lose track of them. Um, do you have any tips for managing a remote and geographically dispersed marketing team? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So to give you a better understanding now of my recommendation for that, I'm just going to uh, exit the full screen. I'm just going to open up a slide. And I'll, I'll tell you my take on how to manage a remote team. More and more teams become remote now due to COVID. Now we all live in this scenario, unfortunately, and we'll probably have to work remotely. So if you work remotely, the best way to keep in touch with your team and also manage them efficiently is to make sure that you have at least one weekly catch up. May you don't need a catch up every day, maybe because you are in different time zones, but try to catch up at least once a week. For example, every Monday or every Friday, we have a weekly meeting. And in this weekly meeting, we assign tasks. So essentially how these weekly meetings work typically, it's not only a privilege of remote companies, right? Even in the office, we can do that and we should be doing that. So in, in most big companies, what we typically do is we have a weekly meeting, which is either positioned on, on Monday, start of the week to give fresh tasks uh, and discuss what happened last week, or it's positioned on Friday. I'm a fan of Friday because uh, I feel that Monday uh, meetings tend to be a lot very stressful. Fridays uh, are better because they also allow you to reflect on what happened, let's say, during the week. So during meetings, two things are happening. Number one is people share what they worked on in the past and what results they achieved, what worked and what didn't work, and what, uh, let's say, they've been doing the last week. And we also get a chance to manage them and to assign more tasks and priorities for the coming week, right? So these are the two things that are happening in these meetings. It's like a stand-up that every member of the team basically takes uh, takes over and explains what work they have been doing, what are the results, and we also discuss what is the main priority. And if there are any issues, any collaborations that we need to facilitate or anything we need to manage, that's the best um, uh, the best time uh, to do that, right? I don't think it's possible to manage a remote team without this weekly meeting. 
Uh, and again, why I recommend Friday is because in my experience, Mondays tend to be very hectic and you want these meetings to be calm and you want to also reflect in previous results. You don't want everyone to be, oh my God, I have 50 unread emails. When is this meeting going to get over? Because we need to just jump into work, right? You want people to come in relaxed and uh, be able to, to think, uh, which is very important also with uh, anything digital marketing. Uh, so that's a great question. Second question, uh, what is the role and responsibility, I think you are saying, of digital marketing executive versus graphic designer? Okay, so a graphic designer is going to do something, let's say, a very specific job. So a graphic designer basically is a specialist that is going to produce, let's say, uh, banners for Facebook, banners for Instagram, uh, display banners, uh, maybe backgrounds for the website, even let's say, uh, let's say uh, images for PDFs, um, any advertising collateral. But a digital marketing executive is probably the, someone who is going to have the responsibility not to design everything, but to execute, meaning let's say take these banners open up, let's say, Google Ads, set up the display campaign, open up uh, social media, let's say, Facebook manager, set up the campaign, upload these creatives, take the copy from the copywriter or someone else, bring everything together, decide on the targeting, monitor the campaign, and also report on the campaign. So typically, the difference between if you tell me I'm a graphic designer or I'm a digital executive, the digital executive, in most cases, is going to implement using different software. So he's going to go into MailChimp or CRM software, build the campaigns, schedule them, get the results, report on the results. Go into business manager, schedule the campaigns, target the right people, monitor the results, optimize, get the results, report on them. A graphic designer is just like something very specific. So a graphic designer is very well-defined role in a way. Important, but... Um, at least in my mind, that if let's say you say I'm a graphic designer, I don't think the graphic designers are people who can, let's say, go in and let's say run Facebook campaigns or go in and run display campaigns or go in CRM and build, let's say, emails. If you are doing that, then you're not a graphic designer. Then you're a digital marketing executive, right? You are essentially what you are doing is you are evolving, which is something that you should be doing in your career you are evolving from a specialist to a full stack person. You are basically building expertise because by moving out of your, I just designed visuals to now I'm going to write an email. Now I'm going to set up a campaign. Now I'm going to set up, let's say something else in the digital ecosystem, or I'm going to get involved with a website. Then you're building your, uh, your wit as a marketer, right? So you are basically expanding, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, depending on what you like, right? Some people just like to design and that's it. And that's fair enough and they are good at it. Uh, okay, so if you hire someone with opposing skills to join a startup, how would you interview and validate that the candidate is suitable? That's a great question because it's the next part of my presentation also. How can I hire the right people? Uh, so I'm going to take your question and introduce a couple more slides before we move on. Uh, first things first, you need to understand which growth phase you are in, right? Because you shouldn't, let's say, hire full-time or even part-time if you're the solopreneur. You shouldn't, let's say, just do everything yourself. If you are evolving into a funded startup or you have, uh, let's say, ambitions to be a, a very big company, right? Uh, you need to clearly define the scope of work. So you need to, before you hire them, you need to write down exactly what you want this person to do. What are the weaknesses? And maybe you don't understand everything, but you can, again, speak a business language. What is our weakness? Our weakness is that we are not strong in creative. We are not strong in copy. Our website doesn't look good. I want the person who can take care of one, two, three, right? And then you need to assess how much work you have, right? So can you keep them busy? Or it's just like an ad hoc task, for example, a one-off. Is it a recurring, let's say, job that's happening? or it's not. Uh, now, with this quick intro, we go into three questions to ask, right? So when you interview them, first, you need to assess their experience. Even if you're not able to understand, you need to be, at least ask them, for example, okay, you came here to, to work as a, let's say, uh, SEO specialist. 
right? So do you have experience on SEO? Did you run any projects? You came here to work as a social media manager. Do you have any prior experience? Did you manage to grow an Instagram account as a side project? Did you help any other company? Did you volunteer? Do you know the tools that we use? And it's better to ask them for a specific example. So just tell me last time you implemented SEO, last time you worked on a social media calendar, how did you do it? Who was it for and how did you do it? And what did you do? From the employee side now, you don't have to work officially. You Maybe you have a pet project. Maybe it's your own page even because you're a photographer and you managed to grow to 10,000 followers or you are, I don't know, a gamer even, and you managed to have a Twitch account that grew massively, right? So how did you do it? For example, in the context of content marketing, in the context of social media, did you launch any campaigns, right? And last time you launched campaigns, for example, what are a few things that uh, let's say you did? What was it for? What was the scenario? What approach did you take? What were the results? By asking these questions, you are going to understand how well they know their craft or how invested they are. Because some people may not have experience necessarily, but they may they may have certifications. They may know a lot about, uh, let's say, these disciplines. And all they need is just a chance to prove themselves, right? And that's uh, also people that very often we hire. Uh, then you need to ask them if they have any industry experience experience or they understand the industry or they are willing to learn about the industry because a lot of the times it's about cultural fit also right so let's say you are in education for primary school the person who you are interviewing no everyone will come from that background most likely they are not going to be from that background but are they willing to learn about it are they willing to sit down and learn everything that needs to be learned about let's say primary school education Maybe you have a product catering to children and these people, they never worked for a brand like that before. Are they willing to learn everything about babies? Example from my experience, one of my first clients was Volkswagen. When I started working for Volkswagen, I knew zero about cars because I never had an interest in cars. Not that I have now, but because of this client and because of brands like Audi and other brands that I worked with through my career, I know a lot about cars. I remain a non-car enthusiast, but I know a lot about the car industry and the models and the differences between them, right? So they need to be willing to get involved, especially when it comes to startups. The other person needs to really like the industry. Right? If they don't like it and they haven't thought about it or they are not excited about it, then it's not a good fit. Uh, and they need to have the right attitude because digital marketing has two characteristics, right? It evolves very fast. One day you, you are doing things, let's say, one way. The next day, this tool doesn't exist. One way you have universal analytics. Next day, Google launches a new tool. One day, Facebook, let's say, campaigns run in a specific way. Then they update the algorithm. Something else happens. So they will need to relearn. Uh, you always need to relearn, no matter where you are in terms of seniority, right? So they need to be kind of excited also about the, the marketing industry in general, right? So they need to love the job and have this natural curiosity, right? Uh, and typically, I recommend you three rounds. So don't hire very uh, fast. Don't just say, OK, uh, we have a conversation. So you seem decent. Let's uh, hire you. Uh, first, you need to assess the cultural fit. The cultural fit means, OK, can you imagine yourself working with these people? Can you communicate? Are they interested in your startup or what you do? Um, whatever personality you have or whatever culture you have in the company is important for the other person to match that right uh, then you need to assess their skills and experience so the first round of interview is probably a call that is very generic it's not very specific it's just to get to know the other person the next round is you need to ask them some practical questions or ask them let's say even for my brand for example let's say what what do you feel uh, let's say we should be doing or try to get a sense of how well they understand their, their craft, right? Uh, and typically for bigger companies, we give them a hands-on task. Of course, not a lot of work because then it's work and also not related to our company because it's not fair to give people um, to get work for free, right? So we just give them a brief that, um, let's say, generic, 
you want to create a social media calendar, you want to work on SEO for this specific page, how would you approach that, right? Something they can possibly do in, in a day. To understand also the quality of the output, punctuality, are they going to actually submit the task? Are they going to skip it? Uh, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, so that's a structure process by the book. Uh, something I always do in all my sessions is I always like to give the by the book way of doing things. But I understand that a lot of people want to cut corners, do things faster, or they don't even have the time to, to run through all this process. And that's why, again, people go and hire recruiters and recruitment agencies. When I was younger, I couldn't really understand why, let's say, with unemployment and with this and with that, people will pay recruiters. Uh, now I can very much understand the, the value that a recruiter can give to, to the business because that's the job of a recruiter, right? To do this whole filtering process and assess all these points for you without you having to go through this, uh, this whole screening process, right? Uh, but that's the by the book way to hire, to minimize the risk of hiring the wrong person, right? And just make sure that uh, you hire the right one for your company. Um, okay, so uh, when hiring someone, next question, how do you validate if the great stars he sees as reflect his her ability accurately versus the team uh, he see was in? Um, that's another interesting question. So keep in, you need to assess also uh, two things, right? First of all, where they are coming from. Where, they, where someone is coming from, it, re, it is really going to define, for example, whether they're going to be a good fit for your organization uh, and how adaptable they are. For example, and I'll give you a personal example because I find this quite hard also in, in my current situation. So because all my life I was working in big agencies and I was working with big clients, I was, let's say, indoctrinated and I was used to a certain approach, a certain way of doing things at large scale and very professional environments. So uh, let's say I was always part of a big team called performance marketing. I was always collaborating with other teams. There were always resources available that we can tap on. There were processes in place, you know, like the, the corporate environment that you actually encounter where you work uh, within a big agency or where, when you are in a big company, you hire an agency, right? Now, during the first time that I transitioned in, let's say sometimes I try to help SMEs or I try to help startups, I have a very hard time because my mindset comes from, you know, like there's a certain quality that we need to maintain. But this quality cannot really be maintained without certain investment or without certain resources, right? So you need to be able to make this mental transition. Essentially, you need to be able as a person to, if you come from a very an environment that is corporate or let's say very well organized, or you are you are used to let's say growth sprints and and maybe testing and these team meetings and conferences and strategy sessions and brainstorming sessions, you need to be able to adapt to a small environment where it's, let's say, three people and they just move fast, they don't have the resources, they improvise, they also accept that nothing is going to be perfect because of the lack of resources. You need to be able to transition mentally and also practically, right? Uh, and you need to be able, the main, let's say, disconnection that I find sometimes, and I think this is where your question comes from or maybe coming from, is sometimes people who are in a very big company, when they move downwards in size, not in seniority, but in size, they have certain expectations. Like in my previous company, for example, I wasn't building the emails because I had a CRM team. In my previous company, I wasn't executing the SEO because my other colleague was doing that. In my previous company, I wasn't doing the analytics because I had an analytics team. And in my previous company, I had other operations and I didn't really, I wasn't really the one setting up the the tags, for example, right? So all these things don't exist in small companies or uh, solopreneurs or startups, right? So you'll have to do everything hands-on. So you'll have to assess now, if you try to hire a very senior person, is this person willing, first of all, to, to go hands-on and get their hands dirty, right? 
If not, is this the right time for you to hire this person? So I don't believe that these people, let's say, uh, someone with credentials, obviously, he was in a position because of skill, right? But transitioning, let's say, someone who is maybe, let's say, Procter & Gamble, taking a brand manager or a digital manager who was used to work with 10 agencies and put him in a situation that he'll have to execute everything himself, it needs both a mental shift and also a practical, let's say, a refresh, right? Because I have to relearn how to work, how to work fast, how to be efficient and so forth, right? So that's the, typically the disconnection between, um, let's say, startups and, and employees, especially when they, they are growing, right? So you need to be very clear what is the level of hands-on that you are seeking, right? And typically, uh, although it may not sound good, it, it may be more wise to hire someone that comes from a similar background in a way, uh, or someone who at least experienced, for example, if he doesn't come from a similar background, someone who at least experienced the growth in his career, he went from exec to manager to, to, to strategist, but he used to do the work. Now he's just senior, but he knows how to execute, right? So the people in the market, they come from different backgrounds. Some people, they just work with agencies all their lives. Some people, they just grow from hands-on to eventually being the strategist, right? Uh, so the level of familiarity with hands-on uh, activities is very different, right? Because if you used to do this job for 10 years, it doesn't really take much for you to return back to that mode, right? Uh, so I think, yeah, that's my advice. Just try to understand where they're coming from and, and manage the expectations for their role, right? Um, that's also why people may not like jobs or may like jobs. And it can also be the opposite. Right? I know people that they want to be hands-on. So I have friends, for example, that they took roles that are very strategic, but they got disillusioned because they expected to execute. And now that they're not executing and they have other people doing this thing for them, they just don't enjoy it because they, they like the execution. So it's not just you know, like from corporate to startup, it's also the other way around. Let's say from startup to corporate, sometimes um, you transition, you feel it's better, but it may not be better. So where you come from and the previous experiences are, are very, very uh, important, right? Okay, so next question. Um, how about copywriter? Will it fall under content? Yes, so typically copywriters fall under content. Uh, Sometimes they fall under creatives, under creative team. It can be the case also. Uh, if you don't have, because some companies don't have a content team and a creative team, they have just a hybrid team that does both creative and content at the same time, right? That's also another scenario. Uh, so typically they are part of either the creative or the content team. Uh, and they may also work very closely together with, with SEO. They may work also very closely together with certain activations on on performance marketing right because they are they are good in content uh that's for medium plus companies for um smaller companies uh based on my experience i don't foresee an sme to have so much copywriting work that they need to hire a full-time copywriter or a full-time writer uh it's better to hire part-time or freelance or even ad hoc right to cover your needs uh, next question is, uh, I'm solopreneur. What platforms do you recommend getting freelancers and how are they typically paid? So that's an excellent question also. So first of all, there are a lot of platforms, right? So let's say we have Fiverr. I'm also on Fiverr to a certain extent. Uh, then we have Upwork. I'm just going to re reference the big ones, uh, let's say. Uh, then you can ask around and you can find freelancers in your network. You can find people from LinkedIn. Designers, typically, we also assess them from, uh, let's say, Behance, because they put the portfolio, for example, on Behance. Web developers, if you are technical, you can actually assess them from GitHub. Uh, so for anything and everything, you can go to Fiverr, you can go to Upwork. The difference between the two is Fiverr is a little bit more, um, how to say, let's say it's a little bit more low end. So Fiverr is good for, I just need a logo, for example, or I need 10 Facebook creatives, or I have a fixed task that doesn't need a lot of thinking, it doesn't need execution. If you, if you want something like that, just an output, if you want an output, then Fiverr will be a good choice. 
if you want more than an output and maybe a little bit more long-term engagement, maybe Upwork is a better place to go. Uh, if you want design, typically, uh, apart from Upwork and Fiverr, you can explore Behance and you can find very nice designers or you can ask around, typically we go with referrals also. And if you want developers, okay, GitHub is the depository that you can find people, but there are platforms, for example, like TopTal, just on top of my mind, there are probably similar platforms like TopTal or platforms that help you to hire developers that have specific skills. Uh, however, the big mistake that happens with um, a lot of people is that when they use these platforms, these platforms will work, TopTal, Fiverr, Upwork, if you are very organized and you know what you want. If you don't know what you want, then your experience will not be great. I'll give you an example. So if I know that I want five banners that have specific specs in terms of the size for feed and for stories, and I know the creative direction, and I also know what type of message I want to have there, it is very easy and it's going to be very effective and very cheap to go to Upwork or Fiverr, find a freelancer and tell them, this is what I want. That's the size, that's the creative direction, my fonts, my colors, that's the message. Now go and do the design, the last bit. Put everything together because I'm not a designer. And you are probably you probably have the better taste. That's an amazing outcome. If you know I want to write this article, I know the top, I know what I want to include. I have it in bullet points. Now take this brief and write the article. That will be effective. But if you don't know exactly what you want. If you are like, I just want to grow social media, but I'm not sure if I want to do advertising, I'm not sure if I want this, I want that, I want some content, but I didn't think about what type of content. I want to create creatives, but I never thought about what is going to be in these creatives. Typically, these platforms are not going to give you the people that are going to think for you when you are small or solopreneur, right? So when you are small on Fiverr and Upwork, these people aren't going to do the thinking. They're going to do the, the output that's going to execute, right? Uh, same thing with TopTal to a certain extent. You know you want to build a platform that is going to work one, two, three ways. This is how it's going to look. That's the functionalities. You have the specs. Now I'm going to find the developer that, that knows PHP or knows this and that, and he's going to execute. But if you tell me that I don't know how my website is going to look, I don't know the features, the features may change. Uh, I'm not clear in the direction. I want someone who thinks for me. The thinking part is typically not um, available in platforms. You will need to go agencies or with personal connections, right? And hire someone that you can develop some sort of uh, a better connection. Otherwise, uh, your experience will not be uh, very, very good, I would say. Um, I see a lot of courses on education sites like Udemy to learn social media or digital marketing. Can a solopreneur do it on their own by learning those courses? Yes. Um, I mean, you're never going to, to be, to reach a point where you're going to be an expert, but I would say that with a lot of courses out there on a lot of education platforms, if you have a natural flair, I am a little bit good in design. I can, you can definitely pick this up or I'm good in numbers or I'm a good, good. I am digitally savvy. You can, you can definitely pick up a CEO, pick up, let's say Google ads. Of course, it will take years to, to reach, let's say, to know everything, but uh, you can definitely get started. It's possible for sure. Um, if you work with senior colleagues who are more visual and don't really know to explain the direction brief of what they want, how would you engage them more during discussions besides preparing reference pictures, draft designs? Uh, that's also another good question, right? So if you are in a situation like this, then Again, this is why a few things in the slides are interesting. Then you need to hire a project manager. Project managers are typically very good communicators. They are people who can, who can bridge the gap between, let's say, people who don't understand anything about digital marketing or web development or analytics with the people who are analysts. This type of role also is, is very important because the language gap and the communication gap is, let's say you, you try to put a data scientist to speak with, a let's say, a business developer or 
you try, try, let's say, to have a CEO on the one hand and a data scientist on the other, or even, let's say, a designer on the one hand and a CEO on the other, they're going to speak to completely different languages, completely. Like the data scientists will start throwing uh, acronyms and phrases that they use in coding. The CEO will speak business, no communication. The designer will just speak in terms that they use in design. The CEO will just not understand half of them. Or they will think that they understand, but there was something different that was trying to be uh, communicated, right? So a very big uh, reason of why we need also people who are project managers, let's say you understand more or less the surface, but they're not necessarily hands-on, is because they play the role of the translator. They basically translate the specialist language to a business language and vice versa. They translate the business language to a technical language uh, for the people who are in the other on the other end and they, they want to execute, right? So they play the mediator. Uh, so what you need basically is to, uh, to an, either you actually wear this hat and you try to play the, the mediator, you try, you start, let's say, translating business language to specialist language, specialist language to, to business language. And you also need to educate a little bit. You need to, to try to educate a little bit of both sides to bridge the gap. Uh, or you hire someone who, who can do it. And these people are typically, maybe there are some people that were hands-on and no longer want to execute. Let's say all your life you were a designer, but now you want to not design really. But you are very well positioned to, let's say, because you are senior to do the mediation between designers and someone who doesn't really understand design, but comes from a business point of view, because you speak both languages, right? Uh, so this is the type of person that either you need to become or you, you need to hire. Um, practically now what works is different, but in my uh, opinion, you need to be as visual as possible to let's say show them examples but you also need to always educate them a little bit so you need not only to just show them okay these are five examples you need to just explain maybe the difference not all together but step by step so in every meeting you just uh, give them a little bit more information on let's say what this means for example for your discipline or why certain things have to to be done in a certain way this uh, bit by bit right um Okay, so last question. Oh, we have one more. So what platforms do you use to communicate with freelancers once you have an internal team? Um, so nowadays there is a, a wealth of platforms that are currently being built and being, uh, let's say, launched in the market. Slack is one of those. Uh, Slack is a tool that a lot of people, let's say they bring their freelancers on board and they actually work with Slack. There is, um, let's say, monday.com, in case you've seen the ad, uh, probably everybody knows Monday. Um, and then there are certain tools, some of them a little bit more web development related. For example, uh, there's a tool that I started working with some teams that is called uh, ClickUp. ClickUp is pretty decent in terms of what it does, for example, for, um, for companies. Uh, so Slack, Monday.com, ClickUp, then if you are a little bit more web developer or project manager, maybe you have Asana uh, that you can use. These are some of the tools that you can hire, for example, to manage large teams, especially remotely or to centralize everything. If you can afford them, of course. If you cannot afford them, Google Sheets is your friend. You go, you open a Google Sheet, you have the tasks, the names, the trackers, uh, even very big companies. For example, in my career, one of my clients was Google. Uh, Google doesn't have Asana or Slack. They just use their own tools. They use Google Sheets, and that's how they organize their work, right? So it's it's equally effective. Uh, of course, Slack, Monday, ClickUp, they bring also elements like chatting, and they're a little bit more interactive, right? So these are four different tools that you can consider. Um, what are common mistakes you've seen solopreneurs do when working with marketing agencies or freelancers that result in lost time, effort, and money? Oh, that's an excellent question. So a lot of mistakes, uh, and I'm also guilty for a lot of them in both ways, also as a, as a freelancer and also as, a, as someone who hires other people, right? Uh, the first mistake is uh, 
there is no clarity in the job or we assume, for example, that the other party can do everything. And uh, why this is a mistake is sometimes the freelancers, they genuinely want to help. And especially myself, for example, sometimes I genuinely want to help people. But it doesn't mean that I'm the best person to do the job. So I want to help you, let's say, improve your website, but I'm not probably the best person to do this job, let's say, practically, right? Um, so a lot of people, because of they, they come from a good place, they will want to help, but they don't necessarily, they're not going to necessarily be the right people to do the job. So we need to both be aware of our capabilities, right? So the client needs to be aware of what they need. The freelancer and the agency needs to be aware of what they can provide. So a good question if you are a client is to ask, is this a job that say that you are going to do yourself or in your agency? or you're going to outsource. Because what some agencies are doing is, or they see this as an, an, an opportunity to get more business and they say, okay, we don't do uh, web design, but okay, give me the job and I'm just going to outsource it to someone else. And then you play basically broken phone, right? So you communicate with one agency that then communicate with some other agency that then may be outsourcing to a freelancer. So you just like do circles. Uh, you, that's super common, it happens. <laughs> Uh, very, very often. And it's actually hilarious when you meet also people that are behind the scenes and I'd say uh, everyone is outsourcing everything to them eventually, right? Uh, so that's a very big mistake, right? So hire people that have the capacity to deliver within their skill set and they're not going to outsource to someone else if you are a small company especially, right? Uh, this is one mistake. Uh, the second mistake is objectives, which is not part of this deck. Uh, but objectives is something I discuss a lot, of, a lot of times through other sessions that I give. Uh, very few people have clarity on objectives. So if if you ask, let's say, nine out of ten companies why you want to to run X campaign or why you want to, let's say, um, run this social media calendar, or do you have a tangible number? Let's say we're going to spend a thousand dollars. How many sales is a good outcome for you? They don't have the answers. Or they're going to come back with a question. They're going to say, you tell me what is a good outcome. Or you forecast how many sales you can actually give me. This is not a good situation for both sides. So both the client and the agency or the freelancer are just in a, in a limbo in a way, right? Because um, there is no guarantee in digital marketing, first of all, uh, especially if you don't have a history of performance. So if, let's say, you tell me I have analytics and this is my historical performance, can you improve it? That's a completely different scenario. So you, you go to a social media manager, you go to a SEO person, you go to a PPC manager, and you say, this is our conversion rate, and this is my CPA, can you lower it? Now we have something tangible we can work. You go to a social media person, this is how many followers we have, can you reach us to X point? This is our engagement rate, can you increase it? This is our... Uh, let's say revenue that we are making, can you increase it by, let's say, 10%. That's a very good place to be. Unfortunately, most people and most engagements, they start with a very vague, uh, uh, let's say, agreement. It's like, I want to, to do something to achieve something. I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know what good looks like. But let's get started with, let's say, this activity. And then it's unfair for both the client and also the freelancer because freelancers put a lot of work. Then you cannot really evaluate whether uh, they succeeded or they didn't succeed. Um, it creates a lot of problems. So it is hard, and that's why people skip this step. It is very hard to sit down and really, let's say, distill what you want in just one metric. But it's a job that has to be done, especially when you hire freelancers, right? Uh, so it has to be done. Let's say you have to tell them that's exactly the metric I want you to move. Because if you give them very vague uh, information, they're going to give you very vague answers that may be useful, but they're going to be vague. That is going to do a little bit of everything, right? Uh, which is not a good place to be in general. Uh, great. Okay. So we don't have any more questions, and I think we don't have any more time. Last, because I remember one question from the chat, uh, somebody asked, I think it was uh, Tamal, uh, how you manage expectations or something similar, I think you asked, uh, how you manage timelines and how you communicate timelines within different teams. So a couple of advice from my end, 
first of all, never launch anything on a Friday. Why never launch anything on a Friday? Because if something goes wrong and people don't work in the weekends, you are only going to be able to pick it up on uh, on Monday, right? So never launch new initiatives or new anything on Fridays. Uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to timelines, always, let's say if it takes two days, tell them four. If it takes four days, tell them eight. If it takes three months, it's a six month roadmap. I laugh a little bit now because every time that I, I work with someone and tells me my website is going to be ready in two months, I know mentally that this is not going to be two months. It's going to be four or six, 100%, or maybe 99%. Maybe sometimes the exception to the rule is they we launch on time. This doesn't have to do with, let's say, oh, the agency was not good or uh, they don't know what they're doing. Right? It's just like we always underestimate the effort that goes in and we have this natural tendency as humans to rush everything. Uh, so it's better to, to give us buffer time to check. Maybe things are going to, to happen a little bit slower, but at least are going to have to be better. And you also have this buffer time to, um, to let's say, if something ca comes up and it's wrong, then you can correct it, right? Because you never know what is going to go wrong. Maybe you see something, let's say, from the outside, and you say, okay, this is a one-day job. And then when you start doing it, you realize, oh, I'm missing basically 20 different things that I need, let's say, to, to work on or I need to ask them, and this is going to cause delay. So always double your timeline. So it's better to, to say we're going to deliver that in four days and deliver it in three or in two than actually say we're going to deliver that in two and then actually push it back, right? Uh, so that's always, always a good idea. So we have to be very mindful of the timelines that we communicate to each other and also to the clients and also to our team, right? Uh, that's um, how we um, we set expectations. How we manage the expectations now is if let's say the other parties come back and say, no, I want this today or I want this now or this is a deadline, um, then we have to sacrifice something. Sacrifice something means quality or maybe we need to size down the task. So either we're going to do it fast, but it's going to be of lesser quality or it's going to be a test or a draft, or we're going to sacrifice, uh, let's say, I don't know, maybe we wanted to launch with three creatives and five audiences. Uh, we're going to just launch with two and um, just without doing any testing. And that's that's to to make sure we're going to launch faster, right? Or we wanted these 10 features, we're going to, to create a website with three uh, and it's going to be fast. Okay, great. So. Last question, and that will indeed be the last one, uh, just to make sure that we clarify everything. Uh, is it common to sign no disclosure agreements when you work with freelancers to make sure um, their ideas are not stolen? Yeah, it's common. Uh, it's pretty common uh, for uh, companies. Uh, and especially, yeah, let's say if you are, the bigger you are, the more likely to to need to do these things because you have also you have to protect data and you have to be covered if something uh, goes wrong. Uh, that's a great point also now that you reminded me maybe as a last bit, which is if you work with external teams or freelancers when you are small, make sure you own your assets. Uh, what I mean by that is in my experience, there are a ton of companies that somebody created their Facebook page. So if somebody creates your Facebook page, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the somebody that created it. So if you stop working with this freelancer and they just, let's say, feel one day that they need to clean up their Facebook, they just delete the page done. So own your Facebook page, own your Facebook ads account, own your Google ads account, own your website, own your assets. That's the best practice. If you want this to be a an initiative, let's say, that you want to grow and you want to be a, pre a proper business, right? So don't have people, let's say, hosting everything in their own, let's say, platforms and then running everything because then you are either hosted to work with them forever uh, or when you disengage, then you're just going to start. We had a colleague or a freelancer that did this once and now we don't know where is the tag. Very typical conversation. <laughs> we always go through. 
uh, when we ask for tools like, let's say, Tag Manager or Analytics, somebody created before, but we don't know who, we don't know which account was that, was it the company email, wasn't the company email. Uh, create a company email, every asset should be under this company email, right? Uh, just as a best practice. Okay, great. So thanks a lot, guys, for, for attending uh the today's session unfortunately i don't have more time because i need to jump in another call uh so i have to we have to close the session here uh if you have burning questions i cannot wait uh you can just find me on linkedin and you can maybe ask me uh there so also for the people that uh have questions and i didn't manage to answer them um send them uh on linkedin if they are burning questions Thank you very much again. Have a great evening, afternoon. I don't know what time zone you operate in. And see you next time. Hi, everyone.